Okay, well, we'll get, we'll get started here. Um, so first of all, um, I'm gonna leave with the thank yous because when I get excited, I can get distracted very easily. So thank you all for attending. Uh, we have a wonderful panel that I'm very excited to introduce. Um, and I'd like to thank those for the panel. So Taylor, Katie, Damon, um, and I'd also like to spend a, a, a special thank you to Sean. Um, Sean has, is, a, uh, is with the National Chapter of Copri and has been instrumental in setting this up as far as um, uh, hosting this on the, uh, on the, on the Copri Zoom account. Um, so again, thank you to everyone for attending. I don't think it's uh, any any shock to say that you know COVID has has had pronounced impacts on our on our personal um, and and professional um, lives. Um, I think there's a saying that I like that goes something along the lines of um, "Corporate America never misses a good a good opportunity or never misses a good crisis as an opportunity." And from crisis kind of comes an opportunity. Um, and you know historically that's always meant by headcount reductions, right? So improve improve margins, improve bottom lines. Um, from any one of these crises, but I think this is this is a little bit different. Where this is, um, you know, COVID and, and moving everything to remote has really ushered in this. This um, you've had no choice but to go to a global uh, remote working environment. Um, and you know, when you start to look at as we start to come out of this on the other side, you know, you start to hear um, J.P. Morgan and Google and Goldman Sachs, and they're all basically indicating that they're going to return to the office. Um, I think Google said that you know by by September there's going to be no more than 14 days of remote working um, without a, a approval from a from a manager. Um, but it's interesting to see that when you start looking at the SEC filings for all these publicly traded companies, they're all basically forecasting you know 40% reductions in corporate um, square footage. So they're moving in one direction, you know, sort of publicly, and then beneath the surface there's this there's this acknowledgement even from those who are indicating that they, they fully intend to be in a um, in a fully in-person setting there's there's sort of these 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 ground seeds for uh, you know acknowledging that remote is here here in some way shape or form and if you sort of look at the the, the more generic uh, engineering field you know there's there's been a huge consolidation right so I think locally here in New York City you have Han Padro who got bought by Halcro Halcro got bought by CH2M Hill, CH2M Hill got bought by Jacobs. And so when you start to have this, this consolidation, you know, there's going to be this push to sort of um, look for ways to save money. And one of those, I think, is going to be, um, you know, pushing project teams away from, you know, really expensive areas. So New York City, very expensive office space. They're going to start to push, you know, you might have client facing roles inside the city, but you're going to start to push a lot of the project to remote offices. So this this idea, like that, we start talking about with um, with COVID. It, while it's definitely there's a definite uh, work from home component, like there's this there's this secondary component, which is an opportunity for all of us, is to really get familiar and working in this sort of remote setting, not only from home, but really from one office to another office, where um, you know those in person relationships or teams are now at least based on um, you know have a have a, a much more uh, dynamic virtual component to them. Um, so with that, we kind of we kind of wanted to have this kind of event to sort of as a sort of reflection back on the last year and to kind of talk about these like lessons learned. Um, so I'd like to sort of um, highlight a couple resources that ASCE has made available to to uh, both professionals and students. Um, and one of those um, is is. Uh, if you go into, if you Google ASCE and COVID-19 home, there's a ton of resources there. I won't go through all of them, but there's everything from, you know, uh, professional development hours to message boards to, um, you know, how, you know, uh, instructional articles about how to transition to a management role. So this is not, this is not just for students, but also for young professionals as they start to go through and, 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 and mature into bigger roles. Um, and the other thing I wanted to highlight was that there's also, um, you know, what this, what, how this, this, this event really sort of spawned was I was kind of thinking back on my, on my own personal experience and, and sort of, um, you know, compared to like where, where new hires are coming into a, to an office. And when, when I was in a, a new or recent graduate working in, in, uh, in consulting, it was, it was a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose. You know, you walk in, you have this sort of toolbox of, of skills, but you don't really know how to put it all together. And you know, so there's often times where you you get an assignment, you you sit down, and you know, you you'd be a little overwhelmed. So it's really easy to like walk down the hallway and 
knock on a door that was open and you know either talk to a, a senior engineer or even somebody who's two or three years older than you I had been there before and you could sort of have that sort of natural mentorship that sort of occurs um, and that's not really possible in the same ways that um, that today's environment is so um, if you're not getting that mentorship or if you can't find it at your own existing uh, place there's there's a, a mentorship program that's offered through through ASCE if you're um, you're more than welcome to, to, to look into more into it but that's a wonderful opportunity to connect you with people who might be able to steer you along the right ways give you advice not only imagining your career um, you know career shifts those those kind of things um, so that's that's kind of the the, the gist of it um, with that I'd like to sort of transition to um, our panel um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Taylor who I've worked with uh, at Stevens um, Taylor is now working at the place where I cut my teeth at, at McLaren Engineering. Um, so uh, uh, Taylor is a, a recent graduate from Stevens with her master's. She graduated in the middle of the, the, the pandemic at the very leading edge of it in sort of the area, the greater New York City area, which is like the, the epicenter. So um, really look forward to hearing what Taylor has to say. Katie, I've also had the distinct pleasure to work with. She's another Stevens alumni, um, graduating with her, both her, her bachelor's and her master's in uh, 14 and 15, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. And we also have, uh, we have the privilege of having Damon um, Jericho. And Damon is, is the global practice lead for ports with Hatch. Hatch. Um, he's also, uh, in addition to having the, the best accent of everyone on the, on the panel, he's also got, uh, he's also served as the uh, past chair of the Metropolitan Property Association. So we have a really diverse, great cross-section of, of the industry here. And I really look forward to hearing each and uh, each and all of your your, your comments. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you guys have questions, feel free to type them into the, the chat box raise, or raise your hand. Um, if you would like to share the comments more privately, um, you can you can send them directly to Kofri Sean. Sean's going to be helping me out with this. He's going to be co co moderating. Um, so with that, I'd like to sort of transition to the first round of questions, and 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 we'll we'll start with uh, we'll go through everyone on, on the panel. And I'd like you know to hear a little bit from every one of you guys about you know what your what your 2020 experience was. Are you fully remote? Um, are you still fully remote? And if if so, do you plan on going back to the office and in what capacity? Um, you know, and and uh, you know if you could go back to the 2020 version of yourself and you could give yourself one piece of advice, I'd like to know what that is. So we'll start with uh, we'll start with you, Taylor. Sure. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Um, as you said, I graduated from Stevens um, in May 2020. Um, so I started my employment with McLaren in September of 2020. Um, I was five days a week in the office um, and with like uh, safety protocols, stuff like that. Um, but then in December, when cases got really bad, we were all sent home. Uh, so I've been working now from home for about five months. Um, likely to return to office this summer, and I anticipate like a hybrid schedule moving forward. So maybe two, three days in the office, uh, two, three days from home. Um, if I could go back and give the 2020 version of myself a piece of advice, it would be to be patient through the pandemic experience um, and enjoy my time off in between graduating and starting work. Um, so it was a bit anxious because I didn't know like what was going on uh, when I would be starting. So yeah, going back, I would definitely tell myself to enjoy that time off um, and don't stress out too much about it. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I think we'll continue going down the line. So Katie, if you want to want to jump in. And... Yeah, sure. And again, thanks for the amazing introduction. So. I've been with Mount McDonald for over five years now. So going back to March 2020, we were, you know, conducting business as normal, all located in our office of about 30 to 40 folks. And we got the email one day saying, pack up your stuff and work from home for the next two weeks. And then two weeks later, it was well for the next two weeks and then four weeks later and so on and so forth. And here we are over a year past and we're all still fully remote, essentially. Um, so, you know, what has started off as a very temporary um, situation has now since revolved into something semi-permanent. Um, and it seems like everybody is 
uh, somewhat in the same in the same boat. But from here on out, now since since we've seen um, advancements in the medical industry and the protection, and we have seen people going back to the office. I think personally speaking, um, for my company, I think we are slowly transitioning back to the office. I think it's a little bit more flexible. So people who are comfortable going back will have the option of going back um, maybe a few days a week or whatnot. Um, for myself, I'm probably looking at a, uh, a schedule of going back to the office on an as needed basis. Um, but to highlight one of the things that I would immediately recommend to myself going back a year from now is that to um, I would remind myself that I'm not a, a siloed individual. I still have, even being physically located away from my colleagues, I still had the network available um, to reach out to if I had questions and support. Similar to what Matt was saying at the beginning of this, um, we we sometimes get stuck in a rut trying to uh, find a solution to a problem. And when you're physically located in a separate room from everybody else in a remote situation, you may forget that you have those resources available to, um, to yourself. So I, I would definitely have um, recommended to myself back then, don't spend as much time trying to figure out the solution by yourself. Pick up the phone call or send an email, get in touch with get in touch with those colleagues that you typically interact with on a normal day that you just have now have to go through the additional effort of picking up the phone to, to reach out to them. Well, thank you very much, Katie, appreciate that. And, uh, I guess we'll give uh, Damon a chance to uh, jump in here. Yeah, good stuff. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Matt and Sean, for facilitating and inviting us. Um, yeah, my experience is probably similar. It sounds similar to Katie's. It's been a long time. You know, I think back to, to early March was when we all left the office and, and we were reviewing some minutes this morning, actually, in one of our calls. And, and the minute note was March 9, 2020. And it was like that meeting was the last meeting we had in person. And, and uh, you know, it was this sense of impending something about to happen. And, and sure enough, you know, being part of the office leadership, we were, we were in sort of huddled conversations every day about what to do. And uh, and two days after that meeting, we, we, we just went home. We sort of decided that was the right thing to do for staff. Um, and, and like Katie said, it was then a sort of a, a series of extensions, you know, maybe this will be two weeks, then it became longer and longer. So I relate to, to, to what Katie said there, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, it's just, you know, you pinch yourself now, right? You kind of wake up and think, man, this has been going on for, for 12 plus months now and, and never would have thought it. Um, Good news is, I think I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, right? As in, I had my second vaccine on Monday, so you know that that that's a big step, and and I think we're seeing that with a lot of people we bump into, right? Every every second or third person has has got a vaccine story that close, or or they've had the first or second, so that's really really positive. Uh, and so, from our company perspective, we we are really actually pushing to get people back in as soon as possible, and and you know. Uh, you know, we think by the end of May, most of our people, you know, that will get the vaccine should be close. And so we're hopeful that, you know, across the states, we can sort of start to get uh, vaccinated people back in and working for early June. And <clears throat> we'll go into it with some of the other discussions, I'm sure, Matt, but sort of part of the philosophy for that is that, you know, that, that it's, it's been a different way to work, right? And, and uh, as Katie said, you lose touch with people and there's a real value in connectivity and knowing your team that, that uh, we want to get back to. Um, we fully appreciate that there's been a lot of good learnings and innovation and changes in the way we work. And so we're going to roll back to something much more flexible eventually. But the first step is let's just all kind of get back to seeing and meeting colleagues again. There's so many new colleagues that, that we've joined uh, remotely that we've never met. So we want to get in and meet them. And then, you know, in two or three months time, we'll probably wind back a little bit, be much more flexible. Um, we're going to, you know, recognize that people now can and do work remotely. And, and so we're going to try to work around that. Um, a question about what would I tell myself, the 2020 version of myself? I think absolutely. It's like pace yourself, right? You know, this, this, I wish I'd known that it was going to be a long time. It, it, as we said, it kind of just drip fed a little bit until we realized we're in for the long haul. Um, but I think it's preparedness, right? You kind of should go into everything in life with having a bit of a long-term plan in case, in case uh, things change. I mean, look at me, I, I came from Australia for a year or two, 10 years ago and I'm still here. So, so you should have a long-term plan and going into the COVID experience, that, that was really important because 
set yourself up properly. You know, you're working from home, you need monitors, you need chairs, it's your new work environment. And, and people recorded sort of work injuries just through, through poor setups in their desk and things like that, you know? And so that's what I'd say to myself is prepare yourself properly and, and set some boundaries, you know, set up properly at the desk and then set some boundaries with your work and life experiences, because as we'll talk later, I'm sure it, it you know, it's become challenging and, and you've got to set some boundaries. So I think uh, that's what I offer. Yeah, I think the work-life balance is something I definitely want to come back to at some point. Absolutely. So I forget, you know, prompt me again, but uh, I wanted to just sort of ask you, you mentioned that there's this big push to go back to the office. And I was, uh, I'm curious to see if that's, if that's across the board, if, if that's a management push or if that's from everyone. I know that there's been a lot of talk, uh, you know, even amongst uh, my own colleagues at Stevens of missing that sort of in-person uh, interaction and that, that collaboration. Um, and, you know, I'm going to circle back to Taylor about the uh, about the onboarding of in a remote setting and all that other kind of stuff. But I was just curious to see if you could if you could give us a little bit of um, uh, uh, clarity on you know if it's across the board, if it's if it's if it's a management push. Like where is that? Is it organic? Like what's that? Where is that coming from? Yeah, absolutely. No, that that's a management management push, and it's sort of a, from all of us leaders recognizing that uh, this thing was so cataclysmic and, and off a cliff that we didn't necessarily prepare and, and, and sort of set ourselves up for working this way. Um, but the good news is we, we as a global company always work remotely, right? We have people in New York work on jobs in Africa, Australia, wherever. So we're kind of used to it. Um, but what we found is we just have so much collateral built up from having people in the offices, knowing people that that collateral and ability to, to, to freely you know, collaborate and trust the person that you're sitting next to has kind of been eroded a little bit. And we just, we do just want to sort of get people back and kind of have a, I suppose, a bit of a group hug and, and get that sense of everyone understanding the culture of the company because uh, part of the culture is a physical culture, right? So, so we want to kind of establish that for a little bit. And then as I say, we'll, we'll definitely wind it back some. Um, that's, so that, that's, a, but, that's, a, that's a great transition there. Um, so uh, this is going to go to, to Taylor, but I, I think there's been a lot of research that suggested that um, transitioning to the virtual work arrangement has been a lot easier for existing teams with existing relationships. And I was just wondering if you could think um, think back on your own experience as somebody, you know, not only breaking into a new industry, but breaking into a new, a new company, um, all of that sort of done in this sort of quasi remote setting, um, you know, I, I would, I'd like to hear a little bit about your, your, your experience and what steps of you or the team that you're part of uh, make to sort of ease that transition. Sure. Yeah. So when I started in September, um, a majority of the company was still remote. So it was a bit of a hard transition to meet people um, and like get to know their roles within the company um, and just like generally learn about projects that were going on. Um, so like kind of to get myself up to speed with everything, I asked a lot of questions um, and I tried to get involved in as much as I could. Um, I tried to join like all the virtual happy hours, like lunch, Zoom, stuff like that, just to like meet people, um, get acquainted with everybody. Um, and then um, in, at McLaren, the Marine Group has like weekly meetings to talk about projects going on, upcoming work, stuff like that. Um, and when I first started, I was given the opportunity to present like about myself on one of the meetings. So I presented like my technical background, um, previous experience, stuff like that. And I think that really helped in having the whole Marine team kind of get to know me. Um, and that helped me get like a role on some projects. Sorry, you still here to get the, the unmute button. Um, but so that's that's wonderful. Um, with with respect to those those happy hours and um, and the, the technical presentation that or the, the presentation mm -hmm. sort of about yourself that you had given to the entire team, did did you feel that one of those was more successful than the other? At sort of you know which what like what was your sort of preference on like what was the sort of best bang for the buck, so to speak? Um, I think I think the happy hour kind of helped me engage with people like talking about stuff other than projects. So that kind of helped me like get to know some of my coworkers better. Um, but the technical presentation helps in like getting my foot in the door into some projects and like gaining a role in, in different things. 
but both were beneficial. Both I got to talk to people um, and learn about different things in the company, which was super helpful, just beginning. You know, how, how early uh, from the time that you started did they give you that opportunity to uh, present about yourself? Um, within a couple of weeks. Okay. So, so, so yeah, not, I not the first week, but sometime in the okay. They, they, yeah. let you, they let you get settled a little bit. Did you did you like yeah. that? Would you have liked it earlier? Um, I think that was that was perfect timing. Okay. Um, I wasn't too nervous after being there for a couple of weeks. So yeah, that was good. Yeah, wonderful. And sort of um, harping back to something Katie had said in your where you said you know um, be patient and 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 uh, you know. Uh, pick up the phone, call when you have questions. Um, I'm curious, do, do you have like an official or unofficial mentor at your, your, your office? Do you have somebody that you work closely with? Um, and you know, how have you been able to maintain that sort of mentorship? You know, ha has the methods that you communicated changed? Do you still have a virtual happy hour? You know, those kind of things. If you can sort of highlight anything uh, along those lines. Sure, yeah, there's, there's like a, a younger members um, like Zoom, group chat so kind of like messaging in there and getting to know people um, and if we have any questions instead of going right to the manager you can message in that group first and kind of get a better answer from like peers um, and with that i've been doing a lot of like zoom chats to ask questions so everybody everyone has been super helpful in like answering the zoom chats um, like jumping on a call to screen share if necessary um, so yeah, Zoom chats have been the way to go to ask questions. Great. And then, um, Katie, if, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your, your mentor, if you have a mentor and, and that sort of experience. Yeah, so in Mont McDonald, we do have a more formal mentorship program that you can sign up for. I have done that in the past and it has been really great. It's an excellent opportunity to meet new colleagues and grow that um, grow that relationship. But honestly, what, in my experience, I have kind of, I have, I have experienced that the people that I regularly work with on projects, like my project managers, um, or people who I consult with, they have provided more mentorship to me that I have, uh, feel I have, I guess, reaped more benefits from. So, um, as we transitioned over to the remote setting, it was really critical for me to just make sure that I maintain that relationship and call them, you know, when the time was appropriate to discuss a certain question that I had or, or have that mentorship conversation. And interestingly, I will say that in a remote setting, um, you know, when you don't have colleagues around you listening to your conversation, it is easier to have that mentorship dialogue. Uh, you don't feel pressured to keep it short and brief and get back to work. You feel a little bit more relaxed. And honestly, I feel like I've been able to get more benefit out of those discussions in a remote setting. Um, now, as we transition back to the office, I think you know feelings would probably change and we would be able to still have those discussions um, as we go back to the physical setting, but it was definitely a great eye opener and a, a good way to maintain the relationships. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective. How did you pick up or how did you decide on what time to reach out? Because um, I know like one of the issues that um, you have in a remote setting is, you know, you, you can't, there's no, there's no uh, sign of like a, an open or a closed door, right? In an office setting, we know, you know, if the door's wide open, come on in. If it's partially closed, yeah, maybe if it's important and if it's closed, it better be like the car's on fire, so to speak. So, you know, did you, did you set up prearranged times to talk or was it more informal? Was there like, how did you, how did you find iterate to that process? Yeah, so we use Microsoft Teams, uh, which has been extremely helpful because it'll show your status, whether you're green, meaning you're available, red, meaning you're in a meeting or a call, or yellow, meaning you're away um, or getting coffee or something. So generally speaking, anybody who is green is typically available um, to reach out to. But with that said, I always message people before I just pick them up and call them. I give them a heads up because I know when, when I'm receiving calls, I like to know ahead of time how much I need to dedicate to provide focus for that next call, or should I really uh, 
change it to a scheduled meeting in my calendar where I can really dedicate a, a better conversation towards it. So um, with respect to having those uh, more relaxed mentorship conversations, I would I would always reach out to the person first and say, hey, do you have a few minutes after lunch or even a few minutes after typical business hours today? And we can jump on a call and discuss a few things. So um, either way, I mean, or you could put something in a calendar and, and that may be helpful for people who like a little bit more of structure in their schedule. Um, but I I've, I've found success in both methods. Wonderful. Um so along those lines, Damon, uh, I had a curious. I was curious for you, as somebody who manages a a a, a large team, you know, in different different geographic regions. Um, you know, how have you managed to sort of? I would imagine keeping in contact um, with your direct reports has been fairly routine for you, as as you you've already got these different offices and you're overseeing different offices. Um, but I'm more curious about like one level down as you start to sort of look at the next level of up and coming sort of future managers. How have you been able to reach down to them and maintain some aspect of, of a feel for like company morale and, and who the best performers are and all that kind of stuff? So, yeah, no, for sure. Um, good question because. You know, interesting, interesting observation through this process, what we found was that because we're kind of forced to communicate through teams and everyone was home, that we set up, we used to have a weekly meeting in the, in the office and people would come, but you'd probably have half the office turn up. And, and as soon as we went home, we thought, you know, we really need to stay connected with people because we're all dispersed now. So we set up sort of every day, we had a 15 minute check-in call. Uh, and it just was wonderful. It was like we had almost everyone from the office dialing in every two days. And, and we kind of met some colleagues that we'd never seen for 12 months because they were on site. And so that was a real positive outcome of just the last 12 months is, is, is sort of getting better at communicating and getting better engagement with people. Um, but then to the question about, you know, making sure no one's left behind, you know, I think through those engagements, it, it, it kind of was appreciating that not everyone's comfortable talking in, you know, a group setting, right? Uh, you know, some people are extroverted, some people are introverted. They're happy to sit there and, and hear everyone else talk, but they don't really engage. And so, you know, we did kind of make a bit of a, um, a proactive approach of just making sure we kind of tap in on the ones that don't, you know, don't, uh, don't contribute as much. Um, just to, A, to make sure that they're, they're engaged and that they're contributing, but, but also, you know, I think to the to the extroverted, you know, people we're aware of it, it, talking to them every two days, and when you see their morale change, and you know, the, they're not their usual self. It's also another good indicator, and 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 we would sort of follow up and and have a check in, you know. Um, also, the other thing I think we did better than when we were in person was making sure we're doing career management discussions. Right, we made them more frequent and 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 sort of was much more proactive on that because uh, that's such an important thing, and and you don't want people to come out of this after twelve months and feel like they haven't progressed anywhere. So, so they were, they were sort of some of the things we did to, to kind of dr drill down um, sort of at that next level. So, so yeah, it's, I think there was some positives that came out of it. So along those lines, the, uh, the previous, like I, I know that there's sometimes a hesitancy, especially amongst younger engineers where they might be uh, intimidated to speak up in a meeting. And I think, you know, now that we've moved to a, a remote setting where there's that extra act of unmuting yourself, you know, that might sort of, uh, further reduce your tendency to jump in on a conversation. So uh, I'm kind of curious along along with your experience, just because you, you had highlighted that before. Is um, you know what you know what what methods have you guys used to make sure that thoughtful questions are being asked, or and that um, you know like the, the best ideas are being tabled, even regardless of where they're coming from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you know I think it, I think it is a similar approach, right? It it it, it is just recognizing that. Uh, and, and, you know, I think this runs in a lot of things. People, people don't, people respond differently in different situations, right? And the group setting just isn't a good space for some people, right? And so the ones that are, that are comfortable, familiar will contribute, right? And, and even you can ask questions to the ones that, you know, are a little quieter and, and, and not, not forthright with their, their thinking, but you're still not going to get the best outcome from those people. And, and I like to think that's okay, right? We just need to be be responsive and flexible in our approach. And so that's, that's to me where you do the follow up, you do sort of engage offline in smaller, smaller groups and, 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 you know, get down to a comfort level that that works for those for those people, because hey, I'm an introvert as well, right? So I fully get that, you know, doing things in workshops, uh, uh, and 
situations is is stressful and tiring you know so so uh you know you've got to relate to those people and and, and be flexible that's that's kind of the approach we, we've taken i've taken for sure wonderful so it, it definitely sounds like it's worthwhile to sort of have the uh as a manager to, to sort of find the time to reach down um and have the sort of one-on-ones or small group discussions um, absolutely definitely um, at this time, I think I'm, I'm going to jump to Sean. Sean, I, I haven't been following the, the group, but um, as this is a pretty small and intimate uh, uh, conversation here, I think we'd like to open this up and see if there's any questions that are popping up in the, the chat. Yeah, so, so far we haven't received uh, any chat questions or any raised hands, but just a reminder that uh, you know if you do have any questions, please feel free to share those. Um, but I do have a couple of questions myself. Um, you know, one question that I really ask kind of the whole panel, because this is something I know I struggle with uh, personally with working from home right now is like, how do you manage to, to turn off work at the end of the day? And like, how do you keep that work-life balance? Um, and I'm just interested in your opinion on whether or not you think, you know, your work-life balance is something that's improved with this kind of forced virtual setting or, you know, if it's gotten worse. I could uh, I could start off with this. Um, so at, at first, when I first started working from home, I had like my little office set up in my bedroom, um, and I had that for a couple weeks. But that was kind of tough because like I was spending all day in the same room for the most part. Um, so I I bought a desk to have in my house, and I put it in a different room. So I had like a little work set up or office space. And I felt that I was a lot more productive working in like a set office space versus just my bedroom. Um, so yeah, that's my my point of view for that question. Yeah, I can second that as well. When I was living in an apartment at the first part of the pandemic, I had a little corner to myself opposite the kitchen. You know, so when like six o'clock came around and my boyfriend was coming in to get some food out of the fridge. That was kind of like an ending time uh, automatically because I couldn't exactly have, you know, a steak sizzling on the, on the stove while I'm trying to have corporate meetings and phone calls. Um, but after I had moved into a standalone house, I have a dedicated office room. So I have a, a door, a real desk, privacy, and it's a much more efficient setup that I appreciate significantly more than just having, um, you know, a, a corner in a, a mutual area. So I think um, the first, um, I guess, I guess the priority here is making sure that your physical space is set up to a point where you can physically leave it and leave your, your work setting there. I think having that physical boundary is a huge component in separating your, your, your lifestyle from your, your work life. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just uh, I'll just add and give my perspective there. I, I struggled a lot initially. I think a, a number of people did just because there was zero separation. There was zero transportation time, you know, commute in the office. So all of a sudden, all of that time just got consumed with work um, and not managing the calendar. You know, you can I think because everyone's home and there's a need for people to now collaborate remotely. People got very good at teams and would find every single available slot in the calendar and and very quickly you got booked up from the full day and and you know you just leave the desk late at night after talking to say australia and and, and it was exhausting but so kind of took a mental stop and say this is a little bit out of control and 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 i found that function on teams or, or, or um um mail microsoft mail that actually pre 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 books two hours of what they call focus time in the calendar at the start of the week and and it's excellent. I mean, I don't let it do it. I, I more manage it myself now. And, and now I've got this like chunks of time that's either dedicated to me exercising or, or, or catching up on notes or something. So it's kind of taking control of your calendar again was the, was the big thing I found. And, and now happy to report work-life balance is excellent. Uh, you know, it's good. So. That's a, that's a great uh, transition. Um, Cause I was I, personally, I found working remotely, um, to be somewhat in increasing in productivity, you know, like you don't. Um, there was a TED talk, I think, at one point that talked about, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of almost like a comedy routine where you talked about, you know, the, the lack of productivity is really you called it M and M's, and it was meetings and management. And you know, now where you've sort of moved to this, um, 
to an, an area where you have this uh, increased um, uh, desire to have meetings at all time and trying to find sort of thread the needle to find it. I was gonna, I was kind of curious to see how how the panel has sort of found time to book out uh, time for them to, you know, for you, you said two hours of just focus time to actually do the work. Um, you know, and for me, like, uh, you know, I think I block out four or five hours and, and put it busy, you know, or something along those lines or, um, you know, how have, how have each one of you sort of gone about that and making sure that you have your own time to sort of focus on the tasks ahead? I think I've used all the functions that everyone on this panel has mentioned so far. I've, I've used the do not disturb button. I've used the, the busy status. I've used the, you know, blocking time in the schedule. And, um, you know, the tools are only as good as your self-discipline because as soon as you set your status, you know, people are going to email you and message you and call you anyways. Uh, you know, they have their own priorities. So, it really comes down to just making sure that you are going to be honest about how much you're going to focus to your to your work at hand and you setting those those boundaries and um, making the commitment to not answer to anybody else. And as soon as you can be honest with yourself about that block of time and how much you will actually dedicate to that, that's when you can really become productive. That's just based on my own experience, though. Yeah, the other thing I'd add in terms of the blocking um, Early in the pandemic, you know, March, April, May, there was also that other suck of time of just watching the news and the repeat cycle, right? Of, you know, you'd either be at your work or you'd be watching the, the, the news and, and it just was no downtime. And so we kind of in our company kind of had a safety share, you know, sharing of, of good process and sort of said, hey, we should all be turning off the every device in the house at, you know, like 10 o'clock. Don't look at it again. You have like an hour before bed just of, of not reading external forces because you can spiral. Um, and that that's really helpful. You know, I find that too, you know, sometimes I wake up, I don't look at my phone until, you know, until I sit at my desk, you know, um, and, and try to stay away from, you know, as, as Katie says, protect your own time, you know, it's valuable. Don't, don't let work be more valuable than your own time. You know, if, 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 if you've chunk, if you've blocked it out, that's a really important thing. That's a great perspective there. I had, I had a quick question for you. Before we run out of time, I, I want to get to sort of the discussion of uh, career management. So I know that Damon, you had, you had mentioned that um, this, the pandemic has been actually sort of more, um, has increased the, the, the prevalence of those conversations. They've been more structured, be it six months or every, every 12 months. One of the, when I reflect back on my own time coming out of undergrad is that, you know, you're sort of conditioned to sort of having this, uh, you know, six month semester, uh, sort of, you go through a class, there's a defined start, there's a defined end and you get feedback. And, you know, I think the, the, the biggest difference for me um, is that you get out of school and it's just one long slug. It's like, there's no, defi there's no defined breaks. You know, you might have a, a review once a year or something along those lines, but it becomes very hard to find time to uh, have those conversations. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear, and we'll start with, with Taylor and we'll move, we'll move to the panel, but. Um, you know, have those discussions like you've been there for just just about a year now. Um, you know, have you had regular discussions about like, you know, where they see you right now, what skills you need to work on, what what your strengths and weaknesses are? Yeah, so I had like an initial like six, six month of uh, review. And then after that, it's yearly. So I think that the six month review was really helpful because I kind of understood at that point what it was like to work at the company. Um, and we were just able to talk about uh, what I liked, what I didn't like, and I also got feedback on my work. So that was helpful. Um, McLaren's also has like career, some career meetings where we talk about like where we wanna go in our career, um, what path we wanna take. So I found that to be really helpful um, as I'm going along, just to try to stay on track and try to keep on top of that career development um, path. And, um, so one of the things that I, th I thought back on when I was working was that for me, like reviews became really important um, on how you came and prepared. So if you had prepared sort of a list of what you thought you had done well, um, you got a lot more out of the, if you were came prepared to the meeting, you got a lot more out of it and you could prompt, you could prompt your manager. So my question to Katie is, you know, uh, as you've gone through the similar process now with a couple of years worth of experience, um, you know, 
how have you made those? What what have you done in your own career to make those meetings more productive? And and you know, are they are they every six months? Are they twelve months? Would you like them more frequently? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a mix of both. I think definitely the the yearly formal meetings where you sit down with notes and goals and objectives and review items. That's 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 really critical. Um, but in addition to that, I think it's also very important to have those. Um, I guess, feedback section, um, discussions along the way. So for example, when you give a a technical presentation to a client, have those few minutes of discussion uh, following up with, you know, your colleagues that were on the same meeting, ask for feedback. What did you do um, that was good? What did you do that could have improved and, and vice versa? And making those notes along the way and implementing those lessons learned along the way as well. This way, when you get to that point where you have that official, uh, you know, meeting, yearly meeting with your, with your line manager or with anybody else, you can, you can relate to specific um, events where you have had a lesson learned and then you have implemented that lesson learned and you have had a, a, a desirable outcome. Um, so I think keeping track and just a matter of, you know, notes and jotting down events, um, is really critical to show and display how you have advanced as, uh, you know, as an, as an engineer. Um, but I think an, another important thing is defining measurement of success. I think before you approach to the next level that you're trying to achieve, have a dialogue with your line manager to really understand how the company measures success. This way you're not, you know, trying to achieve something that is not achievable. Uh, it also helps put things into, into perspective. That's a, that's a that's a great perspective, and then, so I'm curious to hear, Damon, if you if you how do you approach from the opposite direction? So sort of as a as a manager meeting with um, your 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 team. Yeah, absolutely. I think actually, first of all, just what Katie just said, then I think that's excellent. Um, you know, asking for feedback after something that you've done is such a great idea, and and very infrequently happens, frankly, and. Um, you know, I'd encourage everyone to do it just because guaranteed the person you did the work for probably has something they want to say and they probably are either too busy or have moved on to the next thing that they don't give that feedback. But, you know, you either did a good job or there's something that that, that person's thinking, you know, that wasn't the best thing. And, and it can be just really valuable, um, you know, the feedback loop to, to take on. So I, I would suggest to everyone to, to pick that up. It's great, Katie, that you do that because I think that's, that's really good uh, and, and honestly don't see that very often. Um, but it won't be badly received. Um, and, and so, uh, Matt, the, in terms of how we do it, you know, so we, like with Taylor starting, you know, like to have kind of a four-week start of the career, right? Sort of like just a very soft conversation around, you know, welcome, this is our process and, you know, where do you want to go and start to sort of structure that for sort of a, 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 the next six-month check-in. Um, I think formally we, we do like a 12-month, but, but um, sort of career discussion, but I've just found that that's just not long. No, sorry, it's it's too long. Um, so we kind of try to do every six months, do the formal conversation where we, we go through sort of a series of questions, you know, what are your strengths, weaknesses, good contributions, areas that you want to go, like where does your career want to get to? Um, and then promoting also, you know, regular check-ins, you know, you've just a coffee, right? A 15 minute conversation, which as I say, with, with the last 12 months has been so much easier to do. Um, and I tell the story of a previous life when I was managing a person and this young engineer and, and we were having 12 monthly reviews and, and this poor guy had been doing shop drawing reviews of the same job, the same structure for 12 months. And I, I just didn't know until we sat down after 12 months. I was like, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize. And he was just such a good worker. He just kept going. And so kind of like for me, that was a lesson learned and I've since changed, you know, I, I, I now think it's so valuable to do it much more frequently. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the way I see it. I, I think it's just regular check-ins have formal, formal conversations, you know, six months, but the more you can just have a, how are you going sort of conversation about, you know, is there anything you really want to tell me then, then, then it's really important. And, and you know, I, I, I personally welcome it if people reach out to me and then, then I'll prod if they're not. So. So just to follow up on that, but uh, sort of two questions is of how do you, how do you sort of have the equivalent of a coffee or lunch with, with somebody uh, who's in either a different different country, different office. Um, so you know, if you could if you could highlight you know what what you found works, how that works for you. 
well, it's it's easier, as I say, over uh, over teams now, right? Um, and again, that's part of the benefit of this. If there's anything good that's come out of this last twelve months, it's that connectivity to people everywhere. Um, you know, people who I work with in in Africa would never do a video call ever before, and now it's a it's a regular weekly call that we do videos on, and and so it's just such a valuable powerful new thing that we've gained um and so therefore coffees with these people or a happy hour is really really simple you know it's 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 so much easier than it used to be so that's a that's a real positive thing that's come out of this for sure um so so if you were a younger engineer who's relatively new like would how is the best way to reach out to you is that through like a text message or an email like an email like what would like what would be the most receptive way to sort of without seeming forced yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, and I, again, I go back to what Katie, uh, Katie said, which is really good. Um, you know, recognize that we're all really busy, right? And, and you want to capture that person in, a, in, in the right frame of mind and, and be able to dedicate time for you. So I think it's, it's really important that you do, you know, reach out and give a bit, a little bit of a warning that, hey, you want to chat or, or you know, are you free to, to, to chat? And, and certainly don't take it the wrong way if that person's not available, right? Um, I think it's really important, though, if that person cancels more than once, then, you know, you might have to have a conversation with them about, you know, your value and, and, and respecting you. Um, but, but that's important, right, is to try to give them some warning and then agree a time and then, then see that commitment comes back to you that they follow up on that time. Um, so, so that's people reaching out. And then, you know, again, as I say, you know, we as managers have to recognize that not everyone is proactive and confident and, and extroverted and, and may just need a little bit of a prod about, Hey, let's have a chat, you know? So, so it's kind of going back the other way, making sure you, you're speaking to the quiet ones. Great. That's a, that's a, that's a great perspective. Um, Sean, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it back to you to see if there's anything as we're coming up on about 10 minutes to the hour. Um, I just wanted to see if there was anything else that you had to see. Yeah. Um, kind of really just building off of that same conversation we were having, you know, I'm wondering, and Damon, your perspective on this is uh, something I'm really interested in. Uh, like, do you feel like you have a good grasp of, you know, the level of, of trust you have in the work ethics and abilities of your new younger engineers that have, you know, potentially been working for a really short time and most of it virtual or all of it virtual? Um, do you think that you'd feel differently if you had been working with them in person in the office? Like, do you feel like there's a difference uh, in how you feel about, you know, the new employees coming in? That's a really good question, Sean, and one that I actually hadn't really reflected on because um, <laughs> I just don't know, to be honest, you know, because you're right. It's the, the people that I've worked with physically before, I have a much better sense of them and the way they behave. And, and you know, when things are not going well, you can understand that. Um, and so, yes, as it relates to those people and the new people that I've only met through teams, um, yeah, it's all in trust at this point. I mean, there's no one that I'm thinking, yeah, I should be suspicious because I'm not. Um, so I trust them, but, but it's, it is based purely on trust because, as I said at the start, you know, I haven't built up any sort of physical connectivity to these people. And I don't know if anyone's met someone in person since meeting them initially on Teams and building a relationship with Teams, but people are different, right? Once you meet them in person, it's going, man, I didn't think that was you. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, there's a virtual trust that's built up that it's going to be really interesting to see how that evolves as you meet these people in person and, and get to know them personally uh, in, in the physical sense. So it's, uh, um, to answer your question, yes, I trust them uh, uh, and have no reason not to, right? <laughs> At this point, we'll see what happens. <laughs> So along those lines, Taylor, as somebody who's new and, and in that in that position, do you like did you feel that there was um, you being helicoptered or did you feel that there was uh, you, you were sort of had a had a bar to jump above, so to speak? Or how did you how did you prove yourself? And, you know, can you talk a little bit about that experience? So I was in the office for, I guess, about five months before I was at home. Um, so I was able to meet my uh, my supervisor which I think was helpful um, just to be able to talk to him and see him in person and ask questions. Um, but again, some of the project managers I've never met in person, but I talk to almost every day on Zoom. So that is kind of interesting. Um, again, because we just haven't met in person, but 
with that, I try to just like communicate like extra, um, ask for like exactly what they want, ask if I'm meeting their expectations, if I can improve on anything, stuff like that, just to make sure um, I'm giving them what the quality of work they're expecting. Yeah, if I could just add one more thing, I think this is really where the video function plays a key role because when I speak to folks who just have, you know, their names written in, you know, whatever font on a black screen versus when I speak to somebody's face, it's a completely different dialogue. And I feel like, you know, I've met a number of new colleagues through the projects that I've been working on recently. And I feel like I have a better relationship immediately as soon as I get onto a video call versus just a, a regular non-video call. So I, I think that is something that I have grown to appreciate over the past 12 months. I am definitely guilty of being one of the, uh, the, the, the sort of generic icon. So I will, I will, I've learned something <laughs> from today. So, um, but actually, so Katie, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, we had talked a little bit in the beginning about work-life balance and having worked with you before um, and knowing your work ethic and, you know, how uh, immersed in work you were. Um, you know, I'd like, I'd like to hear a little bit on your perspective about how your, your work-life balance has changed and, and how you've managed to set those, those hard boundaries on, on the personal level. Yeah, I think, I mean, regardless of your physical location, there are always going to be ebbs and flows. When I have a heavy workload, I'll be honest, it's very difficult. I think every night so far, I've been working to 10 or 11 to get to meet the deadlines that have been specified. But the difference between remote and being physically in the office is it comes down to when your workload is manageable. That's when I have been taking advantage of not having a 30 minute commute and I've been running over to the beach to grab a coffee in the morning ahead of work or going outside after work to get in a bike ride while the weather is nice. Um, so it is, it is very dependent upon the level of work that I have at the time being. Um, and like everything else, there are just times when you have to you know, put the nose to the grind and then there are times when you have a little bit more flexibility. Thank you. Um, as we're kind of winding down in the last five minutes here, I just want to touch base with uh, with all of you guys and talk. Uh, some I think some of the people on the call here are going to be um, undergraduates and are still sort of wrapping up their academic careers. Um, so my question is, is like for internships, you know, at your respective companies, have you brought on interns? What has that experience been like? Do you plan to bring on interns this coming year? Um, have the past years? Um, and then sort of even more broadly, if you look back on your own academic careers, especially, you know, Taylor, who's sort of fresh out, so to speak, um, you know, what are skill sets that you wish that professors or people in academia stressed, um, you know, uh, you know, skill sets that, you know, either you felt well prepared for that you were, that were maybe perhaps underdeveloped. Um, so I'll leave this to anyone to just jump in and sort of have that conversation to wrap this up. Matt, let me jump in on that last question, if I may, about skill sets. I, I, was ref I reflect on uh, this a lot, that I think something that, two, two things. One of them is appreciate that what you learn in university or college is extremely theoretical, right? And, and the textbook, it, the first job you get is never going to be like the example you did in the textbook, right? So, so we, we in the industry understand that, right? And so we fully expect that you don't understand how to do that particular application. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't put pressure on yourself to think that you, you have to come knowing everything because we appreciate you don't. So what, what I think is really valuable is learning the skill of, you know, humility and, and listening. And, and if someone's explaining an exercise, this is new, you haven't seen it in a textbook. So just, just listen, ask thoughtful questions um, and, 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 don't, don't have this expectation on yourself that you need to know the answer. Uh, and when you do ask questions, just make sure you have an answer that may be wrong, but just a proposed, look, I think this is what you're saying. Is that correct? Right? Because that's a valuable skill. And, uh, and there's nothing more frustrating than just a lot of questions with no, no sort of forethought. So that would be my, uh, my recommendation for sure. Yeah, I can, I can follow up on that briefly. I would also definitely 
focus on communication skills, both oral and written. Um, and that also covers technical writing. Um, it's very, you'll notice when, you know, you work with four or five different people all on the same technical report and you have somebody else read it, you'll notice, you know, who has written what paragraphs versus the others. So, you know, as students go through their um, education process, if there was an opportunity to build on that and, and really focus on harping in those skill sets and bring that to the workforce early, it would really set them up for success because it's just something that you kind of learn as you go. Yeah, I think technical writing was something that I wasn't, um, that wasn't taught too much in undergrad. I think that I kind of learned more just by doing in grad school and during internships. Um, and with that, um, actually during an internship with Katie, I had at Mount McDonald, um, I helped her with a technical report. And some advice I would give like while you're an intern would be just like to pay attention to how these, like the engineers you're working with, right? And how they convey information. Um, so I think just from that one internship, I learned a lot just from reading the report Katie wrote um, and just how to write technical reports. It's a communication. I, I'll share a brief story of when I was interning, or excuse me, when I was interviewing after I graduated uh, from undergrad. And as part of the undergrad, you had to take one writing course. And of course, being the engineer, I had put it off until the very, very, very last semester. So I was a senior 21 year old kid in a freshman writing 101 class. And um, I remember going to an interview and, and I was sitting down with uh, you know, one of one of one of the senior senior members, and they had my my transcript, and they they pull it up, and they look down, and like I want to ask you about this class. You were taking writing one one. Why were you? Yeah, you know, I'm really impressed that you were taking it. You know, why did you why did you take this class? And of course, I answered, well, I had to. It was a requirement, which was the wrong answer. Um, but you know, I think it's it's one of those things that I managed to save it by saying that you know, like writing is part of everything that we do. Every every kind of lab report that you've written, every type of technical writing, it's it's embedded. So you can have the right answer, but if you can't communicate it, um, it's not doing anyone any good. Um, so I think that, you know, that's that's definitely a, a, a really strong takeaway. Um, at this point, we're at the hour. I will open it up to if there's any more questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone, or give this is the last opportunity for anyone to sort of ans ask any questions. Um, I'd like to thank our panel for taking time out of their day. I know that it's, uh, it's tough to find an hour. Um, so thank you very much for making yourself available. And again, thank you to both Sean and, 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 and Copri for their support on this event. Yeah, thanks to the panel. You guys were incredible. Um, it was great to have, you know, representatives from three really different places in the career. Um, and, you know, I know that I learned a lot and I think our student members moving forward will really, you know, be able to take advantage of what you guys have shared here today. And I just want to remind, um, you know, everybody who did come that uh, you, know, you can learn a lot more about Copri at ASCE.org of slash Copri. You can learn about memberships and uh, student memberships are always free with ASCE. You get a lot of great membership, uh, membership benefits that are specific to you. Um, and on Copri's website, you can learn more about our student chapters like uh, what Matt is doing at Stevens. Um, if your school doesn't have one, we can help you figure out what it takes to set one up. Um, you can find this video moving forward on Copri's YouTube channel and uh, all of the great events that ASC and Copri have going on are on our, uh, on our events timeline, uh, including uh, the webinar that Eden shared. Uh, so, you know, thanks a lot. And, you know, we hope to hear more from everybody. Excellent, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you thank all. Bye-bye. Thank you.